So, this week we are talking about the various responses to religious diversity, which of course uh, in our class we're familiar with because I've had you read those very short introductions to Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity and Islam. Um, obviously Judaism is, is missing there, but uh, there's only so many you can read. Um, uh, I, and I did have uh, people read that in previous versions, but there's a, a, a fair degree of overlap with Christianity. And anyway, uh, I cut it down to those four. So, when you, one encounters the great world religions, um, what should be our attitude? As suppose one is a believer of one of those religions, and one becomes aware that other people are equally devout only in radically different belief systems. What should our attitude be towards the diversity of uh, religions, religious beliefs? And um, in the chapters that I had you read from Kellenberger, uh, he puts a name to various, um, various positions about the relationship amongst them. So the main four are mutual opposition. Mutual opposition is they're all wrong. That, uh, you know, evidence for one is evidence against all the others, and because all of them provide evidence against all the others, and then all the others provide evidence against the first one, you're left with conclusive evidence against every single um, religion. Uh, where, for example, as Hume says, uh, every religion cites miracles as evidence in support of it. For example, um, if you remember in the, the Hinduism book, there's a, a miracle that was supposed to happen in the 80s of statues of Ganesh uh, drinking milk, um, and that was reported all across India that these statues of Ganesh were doing that, and that was cited as a miracle and evidence for Hinduism, or at least aspects of Hinduism. You know, Christianity can't cite that uh, miracle, and that miracle very much seems to be evidence for at least the religion that has Ganesh in it. Um, so this looks like evidence for Hinduism, if you believe if you believe the miracle happens. And then, of course, uh, uh, there are plenty of miracles in Christianity, like Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and so on. Um, so uh, all of these religions cite as evidence in support of them in particular, uh, these miracles, but they, they contradict each other. So Hume says, essentially, well, a pox on all their houses, we shouldn't believe any of them. And uh, it's become a common sort of internet quote about atheism, you know, uh, atheist says to, say, a Christian, uh, we're in 99% agreement. You don't believe in all but one of the gods. So you, you are an atheist about all but one of the gods. And of course, you can list millions of gods. There's, there's a, a well-known piece by um, the early 20th century satirist H.L. Mencken, who's famous for his coverage. He was a newspaper man and he covered the Scopes Monkey Trial. But there's a, a, a famous um, article by him, uh, what's it called, In Memoriam or something, and it basically lists all of the gods that nobody believes anymore. Well, not all of them, because nobody could, but it's a huge long list, and it lists like Aztec gods and Norse gods and so on, and he says, you know, it, this is the grave of dead gods, you know, nobody comes to visit these gods anymore. And the, the point obviously is all gods eventually end up in the god cemetery when uh, their religion dies out. And that's sort of the idea of the mutual opposition view. Oh, oh to finish the uh, atheist quote, the atheist says to the Christian, you know, we're in 99% agreement, you don't believe in all of these gods, I just don't believe in one more, your god. But, you know, we're in agreement with the vast majority of them. So you're just like me, you just need to go the one extra step and stop believing in this God. 
So that's a mutual opposition view. Um, you could say uh, it divides into mutual cancellation, which, uh, which is the, human, uh, the, the view that I was just suggesting, uh, which leads to atheism. That is, we, we, they cancel each other out. Belief in one is inconsistent with belief in the other, so they cancel each other out, and you end up believing in, in none of them. Or you could be, have the agnostic view, which is that it should cause you to withhold belief, not disbelieve, which is this one, but withhold belief. So we, we cannot say, we cannot pick amongst the religions because they've all got equal sort of um, evidence in support of, the, all of them can, can point to evidence in support of each other. Uh, so you should withhold um, belief in any of them. That's one view. Uh, that's one reaction to knowing about all of these rich religious traditions that are, let's assume, on the face of it, incompatible. Uh, of course, what we're going to see in this option is an attempt to make them compatible. But on the face of it, they certainly seem incompatible. And there's plenty of evidence of that in the Kellenberger, the most... The most obvious one is, for example, between Christianity and Islam. In Christianity, Jesus is literally the Son of God, uh, whereas in Islam, Jesus figures, and he's a prophet, he's an important prophet, but he's not even the last of the prophets, that's Muhammad. Um, and Jesus is on a par with Muhammad, and they're both human, very much human, uh, obviously divinely inspired, but very much human and mortal. and. Um, and in fact, uh, Islam says that Jesus uh, was not crucified, which is another um, crucial difference. So it seems like you cannot believe both uh, Christianity and Islam then because they're saying inconsistent things. Exclusivism. This is defended in your readings by probably the most famous, at least in philosophical circles, living Christian philosopher, a guy called Alvin Plantinga. Um, he is uh, most famous in philosophical circles for uh, his defense, well, his version of the free will defense against the problem of evil. Um, but in this instance, he's, he's certainly a Christian and he's uh, in fact, a particular denomination of Christian. Uh, he's particularly inspired by Calvin. I don't know if he's actually a Calvinist. He was at Calvin College in Michigan for a while, but now he's at Notre Dame, which is a Catholic school, so I don't know what to think. Um, anyway, Alvin Plantinga defends exclusivism, and exclusivism says, I'm right, you're wrong. Essentially, there's only one correct view, and it's mine. So it is obviously a response to religious diversity. It's to say, you guys are all suckers and fools. That's a bit cruel, of course, and, I don't th and he certainly would object to my way of uh, phrasing it. But certainly, uh, exclusivists believe that other people are wrong. Now, wrong can be uh, taken, a uh, right and wrong can both be taken in two different ways. Uh, you can be correct about truth claims. And obviously an exclusivist thinks that they're correct about truth claims. So, for example, um, Plantinga says uh, he is committed to many truth claims, but perhaps core to his belief are these two claims. One, the world was created by God, an almighty, all-knowing, and perfectly good personal being. So he's a theist. One that holds beliefs, has aims, plans. He's a theist and not a deist. Deists, for example, uh, believe in a God, but not one that is a person with beliefs and desires. Uh, so he's a theist. One that holds beliefs, has aims, plans, and intentions, and can act to accomplish these aims. So that's one. He believes in that. And two... Human beings require salvation, and God has provided a unique way of salvation through the incarnation, the sac life, sacrificial death, and resurrection of his divine son. That makes him a Christian, because the first one is consistent with, say, Islam or Judaism. That's just theism. They're a, a, 
there's several theistic religions. But the second one, that's kind of uh, re uh, Christianity's bag. That's their unique claim. So because he believes both of those are true, um, he says, well, look, I believe that those are true. And in believing that those are true, I am committed logically to believing that denials of them are false. So if you say, uh, if you say that two is not true, I disagree with you because I say it is true. And I believe that I am right and you are wrong. And other religions are committed to the denial, certainly of two. Uh, and for example, Buddhism is committed to the denial of one because it doesn't, it's, it doesn't believe in a personal uh, Buddhism and, and some interpretations of Hinduism appear to be uh, committed to the denial of one as well. So as, uh, as Plantinger says, um, exclusivism is to continue to believe what you've all along believed. You learn about this diversity. Uh, so, you know, imagine you're a Christian, you're a committed Christian, and then you find out about uh, Islam and, and Buddhism and so on, and you learn about them, you read about them, uh, but it has no effect on your religious beliefs. Um, you learn about this diversity, but continue to believe, take to be true such propositions as one and two. Um, consequently, take to be false any beliefs, religious or otherwise, that are incompatible with it. That's the exclusivism. Now, that's exclusivism about truth claims. You are also an exclusivist about religious attainment. So, um, one of the questions about religious diversity is, what happens when you encounter admirable people of different faiths? Um, and suppose you believe, as many branches of Christianity preach, that there is only salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, that the only way to be saved is to accept a particular variant of Christianity. What do we think, for example, of Gandhi? Gandhi was not a Christian. Gandhi actually came to Hinduism fairly late in life. He was not raised, he did not grow up in India and was, did not grow up a Hindu, but uh, he pretty much converted when he went back to India and became uh, a committed Hindu. Um, so when he died, he was committed to Hinduism. What do we think of, of Gandhi? If you don't know about Gandhi, um, and I understand it's perfectly possible, uh, look him up. He's considered, you know, his philosophy of nonviolent resistance was a huge influence on Martin Luther King, for example, as King himself said. Um, so he, he is one of the major figures in uh, securing the independence of India from the British Empire. And he did it not by terrorism, but by nonviolent resistance. So he's seen as kind of a saintly figure. There are critics, as there are of, for example, Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is brought up as an example of a saint, but there are all kinds of people who say uh, she's very much the opposite of that. So everybody's got their critics, um, but Gandhi is often held up as a saintly figure to even to people uh, who are Christian, they say, oh, yeah, Gandhi's great. You know, he's he, he's a wonderful individual as you know, uh, he was a huge influence on Martin Luther King, who was obviously a, a Christian. Um, what happens to Gandhi? Where is Gandhi now? If you're a truly committed exclusivist, Gandhi is in hell. Why? Because he didn't accept Jesus into um, into his heart. So. Religious attainment, in other words, salvation, going to heaven, being one with God, can only be achieved through your specific religion. That's exclusivism. Um, in the Alvin Plantinga um, excerpt that uh, I gave you to read, he defends exclusivism against the charges that it is uh, that it has moral failings and also that it has intellectual failings. Uh, moral failings uh, are most, um, the most serious moral failing is a kind of self-serving arrogance or egotism. 
um, you can see why people might uh, charge this against exclusivism. Now, interestingly, um, Plantinga, when he says, I, when I'm talking about exclusivism, in order to be an exclusivist, you have to be aware of the other religious traditions and quite well versed in them. So, for example, he says, like, my gran was not an exclusivist, even though she obviously only believed in Christianity and regarded everybody else as heathens and certainly believed that they were all going to hell. Why doesn't that make her an exclusivist? He says, because an exclusivist, to be an exclusivist, you have to say, you have to say, yes, I am aware that there are other religious traditions that are equally complex. And I can totally understand why, if you grew up in India, you would be a Hindu. Uh, so that's obviously beyond what his gran went, because his gran, I'm guessing, was a small town person, maybe in Michigan, who, um, who just uh, didn't know about these things. So exclusivism comes from a position of knowledge of all the others, knowledge and conscious rejection of these. Now you can see why cr critics might say this is kind of arrogance, because one of the, the things about religions is they do seem to require, well, there's a couple of features. Most people, the vast majority of people who are religious have the religion of their cultural upbringing. There are certainly converts. Um, you know, uh, there are even converts, people who grew up atheists and converted. Uh, famously, um, uh, the uh, C.S. Lewis, the author of the Narnia books, um, he was an atheist and he became a Catholic. And I think T.S. Eliot, um, also the, the famous 20th century poet, I think he was another one. So there are certainly people who, who have converted to specific religions and sometimes from other religions to that specific religion. Um, but they are very much in the minority, and uh, the, the vast majority of people who are believers in religion, it's the religion of their cultural context. They were raised to it. So they have a religion in the same way that they have a language. It's just the one that was, it's the air that they breathed as they grew up. That's how you acquire your religion. So it's very rare, despite uh, philosophers' obsession with these arguments for the existence of God, it's incredibly rare for a believer to believe rationally because they say, I grew up an atheist and I'm going to look at the rational evidence and, oh yeah, I'm going to say Hinduism has the best support. So I'm going to become a Hindu just from looking objectively at all of them and that one's just got the, the most evidence. That, that practically never happens. Um, so if you're an exclusivist, you're saying, yep, I'm happy with what I got. It's a bit like saying um, everybody is rude except those people who believe in the etiquette of my culture. So it's a, it's a bit like, you know, suppose you travel to uh, another country and they insist uh, that the cultural standard is they take off their shoes when they go into their houses of worship. And you say, nope, that's stupid, not going to do it because I'm right and you're wrong. That just seems arrogant. That seems arrogant and kind of oafish. So that's sort of uh, the attitude in criticism of exclusivism. It's, it's as if to, it seems to be a refusal to acknowledge that you haven't really chosen f your religion for a good reason. You're just believing what you would. It's like saying, it's a bit like saying English is the only true language because I speak it. Um, there's a line in a kink song that goes, I was born lucky me in the land that I love. And I always see that as a joke because it, of course you were. You, everybody loves the land that they're born in. Uh, it wasn't luck. Everybody's like that. And it's kind of a joke. Um, and again, exclusivism seems to be like that. But what Plantinger says is no, if I have uh, the, the true exclusivist, he, he said, is someone who's aware of all this and nonetheless sticks to their, uh, their views. So he's kind of implying they must have a good reason. But at the same time, he's not saying what that reason is. 
So a lot of Plantinga's defense of exclusivism seems to assume that there is this uh, good reason for believing, uh, in, in his case, the two claims that he does believe. And that's sort of in the background. And he says, given that I've got that, why should I change my view? And of course, if you've got that, you shouldn't change your view. But the criticism of exclusivism is nobody's got good enough reason, particularly for religion. I mean, the evidence for the existence of Jesus, Jesus as a person is pretty scanty. There seems to be fairly limited evidence that there was a guy who met that description. So he's different from Socrates, for example. Socrates, who, despite living 300 years before Jesus, there's ample evidence that he existed. You know, many, many different people describe the same facts and events of Socrates. 300 years before Jesus. Are there historic, is there a historical record of Jesus? Not really, at all. So, you know, and yet uh, Plantinga is perfectly happy in believing this, so as if, as if it's as well proven as someone like Socrates. Um, so that's kind of the basis of the criticism for exclusivism. And particularly given its attitude to someone like Gandhi. Gandhi, everyone says, yeah, great guy. Shame he didn't accept Jesus into his heart, and as a result, God is punishing him for all eternity. Uh, that seems like a kind of um, arbitrary position to take. Okay, so in response to this, uh, the Catholic Church seems to have moved to a more inclusive uh, position. A famous event in the history of modern Catholicism is this Vatican II convention in the 60s uh, when um, a lot of uh, Vatican commitments, a lot of uh, Catholic commitments were, you might say, suffered. And many Catholic conservatives think that this was a, a very bad thing. You know, all of the 60s was bad because of all this hippies and peace and love and Vatican II is just one more aspect of this. But certainly it's, it's true that one of the uh, influential figures in Vatican II was this um, theologian Karl Rama, who argues for inclusivism. So the crucial question, is Gandhi in hell? Inclusivists say no. He's not in hell. He gets to go to heaven despite not being Christian. So it's, you might say, salvifically inclusive. He gets salvation despite being a Hindu. Now, why? Why does he get saved? Well, uh, this is where you get the idea of the, um, the anonymous Christian. Okay, the anonymous Christian is somebody, ma Rana maintains that non-Christian religions include not only a natural knowledge of God, but also supernatural elements arising out of the grace which is given to men as a gratuitous gift on account of Christ. Um, so for Rana, there may be individuals in non-Christian traditions who participate in grace. Now, what makes this not the same as pluralism is that Christianity is still the correct religion in the sense of right. Christianity in the sense of a truth claim. So you might say the inclus inclusivity is more in the religious attainment. It is nonetheless true that Jesus is the son of God, if you're a, uh, an inclusive Christian. Jesus is the son of God, um, and anybody who denies that is incorrect. But so long as they uh, are sincere in their hearts and do the right thing, then they can be, um, they can be saved. Uh, none that, so an anonymous Christian is someone like Gandhi, who doesn't think he's a Christian at all, um, but behaves as a, a good person should, even according to Christianity. He's nonviolent, he's preaching peace and love, that kind of thing. Um, however, for Rana, those who are anonymous Christians are nevertheless in a state of essential incompleteness. There is something missing from the fullness of the nature of, an, uh, of anonymous Christianity. What is missing, of course, is explicit exceptions of Christianity. So, 
this is a softening. It says, um, because one, one of the things that's particularly harsh and kind of arbitrary about exclusivism is what not, not only Gandhi. I mean, Gandhi, you can say, it seems harsh that he should be in hell when he was obviously such, uh, basically a saint. But what becomes even worse is what about, what about if you're a member of a tribe in the Amazon and you're never exposed to Christianity and you live your whole life in complete ignorance of Christianity? How could you know? You never encounter anybody who's familiar with the religion and then you die, you're not saved, you go to hell according to some form of exclusive. Now, of course, you can be an exclusivist who doesn't believe in hell. That's okay. But certainly there are exclusivists who believe that, you know, you cannot be saved unless you, um, unless you believe in Jesus. And, uh, or whatever, you know, uh, Islam or whatever you're an exclusivist in. It's not just Christianity, obviously. Any religion can be exclusivist. Uh, but, you know, Plantinga is a Christian and he's our example. So, um, it seems particularly unfair that somebody who never had a chance to be a Christian should be punished for not being a Christian. Uh, and that's what inclusivism deals with. Inclusivism uh, responds um, by, by saying that they can at least be saved. And there's also the, um, the issue, of course, if you're a Christian. There's even important figures from the Bible uh, who predate Anyone in the Old Testament is not aware of Jesus because they're long before Jesus. Um, do they get to be saved even though they're effectively, they're Jewish. Everybody in the Old Testament, their religion is Judaism. In fact, so is everybody in the New Testament um, because, you know, Christianity hasn't become established yet. How do they get, uh, uh, do they get saved? If so, how? I mean, if you're a hardcore exclusivist, you would say, no, they don't get saved either. But um, inclusivism can say, yes, they get saved. Um, what's the downside to it? Well, on the one hand, it's still arrogant in the truth claim sense. It's saying that I'm right and you're wrong. So if you're critical of exclusivism, um, there are still some criticisms that apply to exclusivism that still apply to inclusivism. And also it seems kind of patronizing, you know, oh, don't worry, you'll get saved because you're really a Christian. Um, Mormons, it, it, it came out a few years ago that uh, Mormons were um, praying for the conversion of Jews who died in the Holocaust. So that, because, and this was out of compassion. Here were all these Jews who died in the Holocaust, and according to Mormons, they don't get saved. These are presumably uh, exclusivist Mormons. They were, uh, and they were praying for, and they believed that in praying for these people, they effectively converted them to Mormons. Um, and in doing so, this was an enormously uh, uh, generous gift they were giving these people because they were saving their souls, because, of course, Judaism is wrong on their view. As you can imagine, uh, Jews found out about this and were pretty pissed off that this was going on, although, of course, they don't believe that Mormons had the power to do this, but it, what they were pissed off is the arrogance of another religion saying, hey, sadly, ad adherents of your religion are suffering as a result of it, but don't worry, we'll come in and we'll, we'll recruit them to our side and save them. Th you can see that that seems like kind of an arrogant position, and that's sort of inclusivism's, uh, inclusivism is kind of saying that. It's saying, oh, you've got, your, uh, you've got your quaint little local beliefs, you Hindus, you know, in your statues, Ganesh, really you're Christians. You just don't know you're Christians. Again, this seems kind of arrogant and, and condescending. So maybe uh, pluralism is the answer. And pluralism, one of the, uh, th the theologians who has done most to advocate for pluralism is... 
uh, this guy John Hick that you've got a reading from um, in, in your assortment. Okay, Plur his version of pluralism, which is the one we're going to focus on, his version of pluralism says where inclusivism and exclusivism both say that there's only one correct religion. Mutual opposition says there's none that we know to be true. Uh, these say, so this says there's zero, this, these two say there's one, and this says they're all correct. All of them that meet a certain criterion, that is. Um, he says, what all religions have in common is a belief in a salvation. Uh, a belief in two things. One, that there is another reality beyond ours. Um, for Christians, for the Abrahamic religions, it's God. There's, uh, and it's a person. And God is real and is apart from our universe. There's our universe and then there's God, which is another reality and perhaps more real. Uh, now, for Hinduism and Buddhism, there isn't a God. There isn't a personal God. But uh, for Hinduism, certainly, there's Brahman, uh, which is a, 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 the real. It's, it's another reality over and above ours that is, in some sense, more important. So that's one aspect to all religions that, he's, that, that he is talking about. And the second aspect is that there's sort of, that the job of religion is to sort of guide the relationship between us and the real. And that's what salvation is, is to, he, he contrasts sort of uh, what he calls pre-axial axial religions, um, which are kind of ancient tribal religions, he says. They, they are centrally concerned to keep life going on an even keel. So this might be animism where, you know, there are spirits in the world around you that help you in your day-to-day -day life. Post-axial traditions, he says, uh, where the axial age is the first millennium BCE, and these include the ones that we've been talking about, Hinduism, Hinduism Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam. He says they're, and they're the ones that he's talking about, are centrally concerned with a radical transformation of the human condition. And that's what in Christianity is called salvation. It's not necessarily called that in other religions. It might be uh, the Buddhist idea of achieving nirvana is this. So um, that's the second aspect to all religions. So the first aspect is there's this thing called the real that is uh, more real in a sense than our universe and exists independently of it. And then the, uh, the job of religion is to facilitate the correct relationship between us. And that's the salvation journey. Uh, in a generic formula, he says, is the transformation of human existence from self-centeredness to a new orientation centered on the divine reality. We're naturally self-centered. Um, what religions do is change that and make our focus the correct one on the real. So that's what all religions are. And he says all religions are right in their own way. So all religions talk about something transcendent. For uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it's God. It's the God of theism. For Buddhism and uh, Hinduism, it's a non-personal reality. But they're all talking about the same thing, the real. Now, they say different things about the real. Does that mean those different things are incompatible, as uh, exclusivism says? They, uh, you, they can't all be right. No, they can all be right, says pluralism, because they're all um, manifestations of the real. That is, think of it this way. Both humans and bats can traverse a room without bumping into anything. Humans, because we see uh, the tables and chairs and we can walk around them. So our perception of the universe is uh, partly a visual one. It's, all, it's colored and so on. 
So we have this picture of the universe, and that's what we say the, the classroom is. It's our visual representation of it. Bats don't have that. Of course, I'm thinking of bats that echolocate. They avoid the tables because they squeak and the sound bounces back and they catch it in their ears. So they create a mental representation of the, um, of the classroom too. But of course it's radically different from ours. Both of us, the bats and the humans, are reacting to the real chairs and table. But our perceptions of them are different. Our sort of internal representations of them, which is what for us the, the, the world is. The world is our representation of it. And we say things about the world and what we're really saying is we're talking about our representation of it. So the bats, you know, we can say the world is colored and the bats can say no it isn't. What's color? Maybe, you know, imagine they're blind bats. Um, we appear to be saying contradictory things, because we say the world is colored, they say it isn't, in their little squeaky bat voices. But actually we're not contradicting each other, because the, what the world is, is the thing beyond our perception of it that causes it. So we have, we're reacting to the same world, and we're talking about it in ways that seem contradictory, but we're actually, in a way, saying true things about the world, because they're true about our representation of it. That's like what John Hick is saying. He's saying each religion is uh, an interpretation of the real. And when we say things about what religious claims are, is they're not actually claims about the real. They're claims about our construction of the real. We can't actually talk about the real. The real is beyond language, beyond comprehension. We can only talk about our cultural uh, construction of, uh, of the real. So we can say things that seem contradictory, but they're not contradictory things about the real. They're just talking about our cultural interpretation of it. So they can all be true because all of these, uh, when we talk about when you know people from Christian cultures talk about God, they're talking about the Christian understanding of the real. When people from Hindu uh, cultures talk about uh, Brahman or whatever, they're talking about the Hindu understanding of the real. But we're all reacting to the same thing. And furthermore, uh, you can't say that any religion is more successful than the others. Because how is success measured? And this is the other thing Hicks says. Success is measured in terms of this journey of salvation. But what is evidence of the journey of salvation? It's a successful conversion from self-centeredness to centeredness on the real. And he says the best way to measure this is in terms of compassion. And he points to that all religions have a version of the, uh, of the golden rule that you should treat others as, as you wish to be treated yourself. And this is evidence of love and compassion, which is part of the salvific journey. And he says, can we say that any uh, religious culture is the best one at making people better, at ma making people from selfish into selfless? And he says, no, they're all about equally good. Look at them, you can't say that any is particularly, is better than the other. So, that's all the evidence we have about which is the right religion. The one that is most successful in saving people in the sense of turning them into good people. And they're all about equal in that respect. So we are in no position to say that ours is the right one. There, we haven't got the evidence necessary to say that ours is the right one. So we should regard all of them as equally correct. Um, so that's his version of pluralism. And um, what do you say about it? Well, the main criticism of pluralism, of course, is that it has kind of uh, a version of the flaw of inclusivism because it says to every religious person, uh, your view is uh, what you think you're doing 
in believing in the Son of God as literally true. Yeah, it's not really true. There isn't really a God in the solely personal sense. That's just your version of it. That's your understanding of it. It's a bit like all religions are a bit like um, Norse religion re uh, presenting thunder, explaining thunder as in terms of a God of thunder. You know, and we think, oh, silly old uh, Viking was thinking that thunder was a person with a big hammer. Pluralism is kind of saying that about all religions, silly old Christians in presenting the real as personal. Now, he, say, he doesn't say that that's wrong, but it's just part of your cultural practice. And again, that seems a little bit, um, a little bit patronizing. All right, so in the, the second chapter I had you read from Kellenberger, he talks about um, different flavors of pluralism. So it's not like these are eight different attitudes. These are, uh, there is the, none of the religions are true, one of them is true, all of them are true, and this is different ways in which you could flesh out the idea of pluralism. So these are all committed to the idea that in some sense all of the uh, great religions, at least, are on equal standing. So there are different ways to understand pluralism. Now, John Hick has a complete version of pluralism, so you could say John Hick's version is uh, like the first pluralist, and then there are these other, um, other variants. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about each of them and explain um, something about the main points of each of them. Uh, the different aspects of the, um, the different aspects approach to religious diversity. It sounds a lot like what I've just said about John Hick in that um, each religion is explaining an aspect of the real. It's got this similar idea that there is uh, a transcendent reality and obviously it's not necessarily God, because if it's God, then that means that, Hindu, that Buddhism is false. Um, so it's, it's like Hick's idea of the real. Uh, and I came pro across someone fairly well-educated who, who was not familiar with this parable. It's a Buddhist parallel, parable, and I heard it, I, I don't remember never not knowing it, but anyway, in case you're not familiar with it, uh, the five blind men and the elephant is um, five blind men encounter an elephant and each of them is asked to describe the elephant. And of course they describe it in different ways because one of them is holding the tusk and they describe the elephant as, you know, uh, as like a, a cold, hard, you know, pointy thing. That's what an elephant is. And then another is holding the leg and he says, oh, it's like a tree. Um, and the other one's uh, holding the trunk and the tail and so on. So they all, uh, like the one holding the tail say, says that it's like a snake, because that's what it feels like. So each of the five blind men is describing the elephant, but incompletely. So they're just describing an aspect of the elephant. Now, uh, according to, hence, different aspects approach, um, so, according to this view, each of the great religions is describing an aspect of the real. How is this different from Hick? Well, Hick says the religions are not actually talking about the real, and you cannot talk about the real. The real is ineffable. What each of the religions is talking about is this construct. Like I said, it's sort of the subjective picture of the real, but not the real itself. That's what all religious statements are about. Um, whereas this view says, no, they are, each religion is actually describing an aspect of the real. So it is, in some sense, for Hick, religions, religious claims don't talk about the real, they talk about our uh, representation of the real, which is a cultural construct. That's what religious, religious statements are talking about, not the real that the, co the co construct is supposed to represent. Whereas on this view, uh, religion is talking directly about um, an aspect of the real. So that's the difference there. Um, 
all, uh, uh, for the different aspects approach, different religions can all be right in that each has true beliefs about an aspect about of di uh, religious um, uh, about about the real. Um, now, what's what's some problems with this? Well, it depends how wide uh, uh, how how many different kinds of cultural practices count as religions. So, for example, do we count the Jim Jones phenomenon and Nazism, which was, had a almost religious intensity about it, uh, and nowadays, of course, uh, what didn't exist when Kellenberger wrote this, is QAnon. QAnon seems to have some aspects of religion. Do we count those kind of things as uh, also, talking about an aspect of the real. That would be worrying. Uh, is Nazism right about this thing that uh, Christianity calls God? Is it just another aspect of God? Um, that would be uh, disconcerting. Now, the way that Hicks' pluralism avoids that is because he limits the things that count as religions under his, uh, in his conception as ones that have salvific ideas, you know, and are trying to go from selfishness to uh, selflessness, um, whereas that isn't part of the different aspects view. So it seems like it has to count a wider diversity th of things. Jim Jones, uh, of course, was the, the cult leader who uh, set up that community in Guyana and um, when things went south for him and he knew that uh, the, the FBI was... He, he killed uh, a politician. I think it's the only case of a sitting politician being killed was somebody who came down to investigate what was going on in this community and now when they were trying to get away, they shot them. And so he knew that all hell was going to be unleashed on his community and he persuaded everybody to drink poisoned... It wasn't actually Kool-Aid, but this is where the statement drinking the Kool-Aid comes from. It was like a Kool-Aid knockoff or anything. But it was all poisoned and everybody committed mass suicide. Knowing, it, you know, parents fed poisoned Kool-Aid to their children, knowing that they were killing their children. That seems like, uh, well, certainly they had a religious intensity. And of course, there's other, that other religion uh, the, that uh, committed suicide in the 90s because they thought they were going to join a flying saucer following the Halle Bopp comet. Um, do we count those as well? Uh, it doesn't seem like they, the different aspects can rule that out. Um, and uh, also another example is the Tugs in India, which is where we get Tuggies or, or Tugs, this, was re this religious sect that followed the goddess Kali. That's where we get the, the word thugs, um, it's, it comes from this Indian term referring to follow Tuggies who, were, who would basically murder people on the road as, uh, because the goddess of death commanded them to and they would bury them in shallow graves. And it was, it was a big problem that there was uh, a large number of these people just murdering people in the name of Kali. Um, okay, the common core approach. Common core, you know, it's self-explanatory that um, all religions are committed to an, a, a basic share, a basic common core of beliefs. That is the idea. So yes, of course, there are some parts of religions uh, that are incompatible, like the, the disagreement between uh, Islam and Christianity about Jesus and also there's another one between Islam and Christianity uh, of the story of Abraham. In Judaism and Christi Christianity, Abraham is told to kill his son Isaac by Sarah, whereas in um, Islam he's told to kill his son Ishmael by uh, his slave woman um, who is Arabic. Uh, so there's a disagreement in claims there that appears to be contradictory. The Common Core says let's focus on a certain uh, consensus that they all share. Uh, now there's Common Core of beliefs, that is claim, literal truth claims that we make. Um, 
Now, what are truth claims that they make that they can agree on? It seems like the major criticism of Common Core is there aren't that many, really. I mean, they don't agree on whether or not God is a person or, or any of that stuff. So what Common Core has to say is that, well, maybe things are changing and that it will, um, that the number of beliefs will expand. Uh, and one suggestion in support of this is Hicks' notion of mythological truth. And mythological truth is the idea that things can be not literally true. Uh, so, in John Hicks' sense, beliefs are mythologically true when they are not literally true of or do not apply to religious reality, but are truthful in the sense that the dispositional responses which they tend to evoke are appropriate to our existence in relation to the real. And he gives us an example. The Christian belief that God is our Heavenly Father may be considered mythologically true because it encourages in Christians a sense of trusting, a trusting and loving relation to God. So maybe the common core claims can be mythologically true and not necessarily literally true, and that can expand the number of common core claims. Um, I'm going to tell you a story now of where I've encountered this idea of religious truth, as it was used. When I graduated from my graduate school, which was the University of Southern California, uh, went away and got a job in Arkansas, but stayed in touch um, with all of the professors there, because it was a great department, we really got on, and got an email, like about a year after we'd left, saying, hey, have you seen this, um, this email going around your university, because it seems to be nationwide. And this was an email that said, told a story about a philosophy professor at USC. And the story went like this. It was a story that this philosophy professor at USC uh, was a raving atheist and used to, every, every year, um, he would uh, say at the beginning of semester, are there any uh, religious people here? And people would raise their hands and you'd say, you fools. Nobody will, uh, if you say that at the end of the semester, well then you're irredeemable fools because I'm going to give you conclusive evidence that all religions are nonsense. And so the entire semester was basically berating religions and, and saying that anybody who was religious was an idiot. And then at the end of the semester, he asks again, anybody religious? And one brave Christian raises his hand, according to this story that was circulated in, in emails. And uh, the, the professor says, uh, you idiot, I can disprove to you right now. If there was a God, then this chalk wouldn't break. And he drops a piece of chalk, and, and it's a hard stone-flagged floor of this uh, lecture hall and he drops a piece of chalk and out of a, a freak accident it, bounce, it lands and catches in his pants leg and rolls unbroken along the floor and he looks down at it freaks out because apparently there is a god and runs out of the room and then the brave Christian comes to the front of the room and starts proselytizing. This story was told as fact and circulated nationwide. It was bouncing around. And, and actually, a week after I got that email, I said, I, no, we haven't seen that. A secretary at uh, the university we were teaching at in Arkansas said, here's a, uh, here's a heartwarming story uh, to start your day. And circulated this story verbatim, talking about a philosophy professor at USC. So it was, being, it was like uh, the early days of going viral, you know, when it was just via uh, email. And this was doing real harm to the philosophy department at USC uh, because parents were coming up to Ed McCann, who is still there and was the chair at the time, and saying, you know, what's this? I'm not sending my kid to your, take your classes if this is what's going to happen. And, he, <laughs> and Ed joked, he said, if it was one of my faculty, he would have said two out of three, best two out of three uh, with the chalk. Uh, but he couldn't say that to the parents because uh, they would get mad at him. But he was 
pissed off about this because this is just lies. Uh, nobody in the department did that. Um, and he traced it to a guy who'd started it and he managed to find the guy. And he said, why are you circulating lies about our department? And the guy said, well, it has religious truth. And he said, what's that? I guess it's this idea, religious truth. It's supposed to encourage, uh, what, people to become Christians? I don't know. Um, I don't know that this idea of religious truth uh, or mythical truth uh, I get metaphor, I get stories that are supposed to represent something, like five blind men and the, the elephant, but they're not true. They're not, uh, there weren't five blind men, it's just a way of illustrating something. Um, so I'm not sure how helpful that is. All right, so common core of practice, that is uh, like Hick's idea of um, that all the all the religions have the same basic commitment to the golden rule and that all religions are um, invested in this idea of making better people. Um, but as they say, as Kallenberg says in the, um, in the criticisms of Common Core, well, but better people means different things for different religions. So for example, he gives um, he gives an example from Ninian Smart. Remember Ninian Smart? He was the guy who talked about the seven features that every religion should have. Anyway, uh, Ninian Smart says, consider a village in which there are many who are un hungry and underfed. A Christian reaction, exemplifying love of neighbor, might be to provide food to relieve the immediate need and then to teach the villagers to hunt and fish so that they can provide food for themselves. However, the Buddhist reaction to this form of aid might not be approval. The Buddhist compassion extends to sentient beings other than human beings. So the, the Buddhists might view providing, uh, make, uh, teaching the, uh, the villagers to hunt as a f equivalent to teaching them to murder. So saying you're doing the wrong thing. So it's not even sure that, uh, that in saying that, yes, you can say that they have the common core of making better people, but this won't re result in, in similar activities, and better is so vague that it means contradictory things in different um, religions. Indeterminacy. The indeterminacy says that, um, contrary to what uh, Plantinger says, that, uh, you know, if I believe propositions one and two, then that logically means that I think that people who believe the, the negation of those are wrong, so, so you cannot avoid contradiction amongst the various religions. He says, uh, uh, the guy John Whitaker, who argues for this, says that you can have, um, you can have indeterminate logical reactions, uh, sorry, logical relationships between propositions. So, for example, compare Jesus is the Son and God and Buddha attained enlightenment. Um, do they contradict each other? He says, well, there are sometimes you, you, cannot say that uh, you cannot say that they contradict or they're compatible. It's unclear. And he gives examples of when it might be unclear. Uh, so, for example, um, there's a famous meaningless but grammatically correct sentence. This, this is used by philosophers of language to illustrate the difference between grammar, which is his own standards of correctness, and, uh, which is syntax, and semantics, which is to do with meaning. And it says you can pass the rules of grammar and still fail to be meaningful. So, for example, the sentence is, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Now that's got all the nouns and verbs and adjectives in all the right places, so it, it's grammatical. But of course it doesn't mean anything because it involves what's called category mistakes. You can't have anything that is colorless also be green. You can't sleep furiously. Um, and you, uh, ideas can't have a color or lack a color. So uh, he says, um, there are cases where a use of a predicate like um, 
a predicate is the part of the sentence that applies to the subject. Uh, the, the use of a predicate would involve a, a category mistake. So there you couldn't say that there was any logical contradiction with it. Then there are cases where the standards for applying the, the predicate are unclear. Arthur is either great or not great. We don't know enough about Arthur and the standard for applying it to be able to answer it. So basically he's saying it's indeterminate whether or not things contradict each other. Um, and for example, a, a Rubik's cube. To say of a cube that the cube has a red surface, um, it's true, but it's not the whole surface, so it's partly true and partly false. This is uh, the point of someone called Shivesh Thakur, who also gives a similar view. So the basic idea is that um, you can avoid contradiction and they can all be true in their own way. So again, it's trying to preser preserve pluralism in the face of exclusivist con uh, uh, criticisms. Um, but it's hard, yes, you can say it, certainly come up with examples of sentences where it's indeterminate, but there do seem to be clear cases amongst the uh, religions where you've got, they're talking about the same thing and they're saying directly opposite things. Again, the example from Christianity and Islam about Abraham and about Jesus. Um, finally, relationships. Um, this is where Instead of thinking of uh, religions as sort of doctrines, sets of, sets of beliefs, we think of um, a religion as facilitating a relationship. Uh, slightly confusingly, it's in the, um, in the discussion of indeterminism that they bring up the analogy that the Whitaker makes between falling in love between love and um, uh, love and religion. So, for example, um, the thing about love is when you love somebody, the person that you love might be indistinguishable in in various respects from other people, but your love is still just for that one person. I mean, you could love one member of a pair of twins and only fall in love with that person even though they're identical to somebody else. Um, it is as, and he says, it's as odd to ask a religious believer why do you have this religion as it is to ask a man why do you love this woman? Um, why do you love this woman? Uh, it's just, that's what love is. Love is, is, is fixates on a particular thing. So. Um, this view seems to allow for us to stay specifically Christian while acknowledging that Christianity is not any more true than any of the others. So it enables you to remain true to one religion. Um, and the relationships view seems to have this, this idea that uh, the religions facilitate a relationship between you and the real. And it doesn't have to be that you understand the nature or that you can even say anything correct about um, the nature of the being with whom you are in a relationship. So a faith relationship is a relationship to God that believers are in by virtue of having faith in God. Now, as, what does that mean? To have faith in a person, it's not necessary to have a true understanding or conception of a person. Two people may have faith in the same person with different conceptions. So this is again the idea, the person in this case is like the real and a Hindu has faith in the real because of Hinduism and uh, a Christian has faith in the real because of Christianity and neither of them necessarily, neither of them necessarily has the right conception of them but their relationship is still a real one. So to have faith in God, it is not necessary to have a true understanding or conception of God. Two people may have, may have faith in the same God or the same real with different understandings of God. And these conceptions may even be incompatible. So it's, uh, it allows for contradictions 
because it says that uh, the relationship is the important thing. And the abiding relationship is, um, is uh, a relationship whose existence is constituted by actions. Um, so that would be like helping other people. Um, in the New Testament, in his first letter, John says that he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Through abiding in love of others, through dwelling in love and being loving, John is saying one abides with or dwells in God. So living a good lifestyle enables you to, uh, is an abiding relationship. So for example, uh, a Christian can say that Gandhi was in an abiding relationship with God. Uh, okay, what do we say about that one? Um, well, it, it's odd to talk about a relationship with, um, in, in the context of Buddhism. Buddhism doesn't really say that you have to get into a relationship with anything. You just have to achieve nirvana. So it doesn't seem to fit everything. Um, and also, it doesn't seem to, again, it seems to be kind of patronizing to uh, believers. It says, you don't really understand. You believe in the literal word of your faith, but, you know, that's just a way to achieve a relationship with the same God that people of other faiths have a relationship with. But none of you really have a correct understanding of it. So, it's, uh, you might say, it's a little bit patronizing there. But, these are different ways to um, try and respect a sense in which all religions can be true, while also allowing, certainly the indeterminacy and the relationship one, allow you to stick with your religion. So it allows you to be a Christian, and Hick, for example, is a Christian, uh, while at the same time acknowledging, so you get to stay Christian, you get to do your Christian things, you go to Christian church, you don't have to go to all of the different religions, while acknowledging that what you're doing is no better or more, no more correct than the other forms of worship. Uh, but the mutual opposition guys are going to be saying, it's all bullshit, uh, what are any of you doing? Okay, I think that'll do.